Hey everyone from What's Cracking Land. This is Jim Phoenix, and today is something we've been working on for a while. I can't believe it. We got the Amazon bestseller in serial killers like ever, ever. And even that at the end of the interview. Yeah, we got an exclusive reading. So without any further ado, hit this. Hey everyone, Jim Phoenix here, and boy, am I excited for this next guest, because I can say their name, I hope, cross fingers, who knows, uh, Rhiannon DeVerk, did I say it? Yes. Yes. Oh, it's <laughs> half my battle right there. I am done. I'm going to retire early today. <laughs> we have a very special privilege because this is something near dear my heart. It's, that's almost a pun, serial killers who <laughs> killed predominantly men or boys, actually, right? Was it men or boys? A bit of both. Yeah. Bit of both. Yeah, he didn't discriminate. And this is not near and dear to my heart, a necrophiliac, if I am really correctly. So yes. we've got none other than the author of, and I'll, I'll say right now, the Amazon bestseller, mm-hmm. Boy Underwater, <laughs> Dennis Nilsson's story. The story of a serial killer. Yay. And that's the perfect thing. <laughs> oh, my God. I have to say. I love stuff like this. This is, you know, I grew up with the the Jeffrey Dahmers, not literally, that'd be weird, but the yeah. the the Gacy's. <laughs> this is my this is my upbringing, you know, like a lot yeah. of a lot of them lived in the United States. Mm. Believe it or not. Yeah, yeah. And you get the one that was not the US. So yeah. how did you find out about them? What was the what was the call to write this book? I've always been interested in true crime. Um, my dad was interested in it and, nice. you know, that kind of, hey, what's this book on my dad's shelf that I probably shouldn't read at this age? Let's look at that. Um, you know, and started to learn about serial killers. Um, I also had, um, so we lived quite near to Soham. So yeah. the Soham girls, um, when they were murdered, sadly, they were actually quite close to my age. So that really was quite a formative experience in terms of right. It's like, okay, I need to know about this topic. How do I keep myself safe? Because this could happen to me because this has happened to someone near my age, close to my area. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I think I have a fascination from there of just like, what have people done to survive right. serial killers? That's really fascinating to me. Um, what about the people that didn't survive or escape? You know, what right. happened with them? You know, and, things like, you know, like Ted Bundy introducing himself as a cop or saying, I need help with my car. I'm like, right, okay, put that one in the bank. We avoid anyone who says that. <laughs> right, and that was, that was the error. I, I was thinking about this today with cell phones. We don't really have that anymore or as much. Mm-hmm. People would break down and you would drive by and, and you would like, oh, man, we have to stop. I remember my dad always having this stuff like, we have to stop. I'm like, okay. But that was <laughs> it. He could just yeah. killed everyone. Uh, the guy, not my dad. Well, maybe both at this point. Who knows? But <laughs> what were the tips that you, because this was near and dear to personal to you, what yeah. were the tips that you learned what not to do? I mean, spies, you know, don't stop for anyone ever. Yeah. Especially in dark roads. What are the tips you have? Um, don't let someone into your house, um, especially as a woman living on your own um, or just being alone in the house. Maybe everybody else is out. Um, you know, I had a couple of years ago, I had a policeman came to my door and he said, oh, we had a report of a noise disturbance in the area. Can I just come in and check that everything's fine? And I let him in. And within three seconds of letting him in, I was going, what are you doing? This could be a fake police officer that's here to kill you. He wasn't. Thankfully, he was yeah. real and he was left because he realized he got the address wrong. But <sighs> next time, next time he's not coming in. <laughs> There's no more police in this house next time. You sound like all my neighbors now. Oh, for different reasons, though. But okay, but that's exactly it. We we see things like, oh, I should have done that. Right. It, it's it's the edit out. But you know better, and you making a list of how to stay safe. And does that list change as the technology for serial killing changes? You know, what I mean, yeah. it's like they have different I'm- ploys now. It's like doxing, and I guess that a serial killer is just being an a hole. But yeah, or and also a dangerous just- one. You have to be really aware now, I think, of when you, you're you not in, because we have certain safeties. Like you say, we have our mobile phones. Yeah. Well, when you're in an area where you don't have signal, maybe like you're in a campground or something, you have to be extra aware of that, I think, because we forget that these safety blankets aren't always around anymore. No, that that's that's true. I 
a camp area or just the state of Wisconsin in the United States. There's like, there's entire states are like no signal whatsoever. I'm like, how did right. you guys, my mom had dial up until this month. I'm like, how did you guys do this? <laughs> Why? Why? We, we take that for granted. We take all our interconnectivity for granted until the minute we, move, you know, we lose it. Boom. And the world yeah. becomes vastly bigger and very, very scary. We can't just like lean on our phones no more. That's yeah. that's good. I always have a backup. Do you have like a escape bag or do you have like a. <laughs> I have, I usually have like an ongoing plan of like, <laughs> what really? we do like, and not just serial killers, you know, zombie apocalypse, like oh, anything, yeah, we all have but, that, no. you know, but we just moved last year to this house and it has a giant glass, you know, like double doors with glass windows to the side in the living room. And I'm like, well, that's it. We're going to die. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> oh, oh, oh my God. I'm so sorry. I, I know exactly how that kind of like fits in your mind because it's like, I have to board this up. Oh, yeah. What do I, what do I, should we just like, is there a barn door I can put here instead? Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly, it was like the, uh, we were doing some safety drills a couple of days ago and like, and I was like, oh, this is a good, like, no, this is a bad room. This is like, this is a glass wall, guys. You're all dead. I'm so sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry to tell you, there's, there's no way to help you here. Uh, yeah. Good luck. <laughs> that, that was my first recommendation like and next room where people probably won't die i don't know okay so we have these things and we have these things since childhood and it informs us as an adult so how did you get from learning about it to writing about it because that's the gap so yeah so i've been a writer for a long time as well um actually pretty much from around the same time i would say um but i was writing other things right i was i'm a ghost writer so i write for other people and I oh. started to think, oh, you know, like that's what it means. I thought yes, you were, you were not, dead. not like I'm a ghost. Oh animal. my god! I was like, ah, oh. yeah. <laughs> that's a different, <laughs> different show. I didn't know that. Yeah, <laughs> I was getting my Pazuzu out. I'm like, oh. yeah. <laughs> so you write, you write for. I used to be a ghost writer too. Uh, you write for other people without putting your name on it. Exactly. So I I've, thought yeah. I, I want to do that. I want to put my name on something. Um, and I, yeah. I can't remember who it was now, but there was a serial killer that died around the time that I was thinking about this. Um, Ian Brady, maybe? I don't know. I can't remember. Um, and I went on Amazon that day, and the top 10 best-selling books were all books about this guy that had just died. And I thought, hang on. I think I see a publicity opportunity here. Okay. Who's still alive in prison? <laughs> Let's get researching. Um, it turned out Dennis Nielsen was at that time. <laughs> right? No, that's that's brilliant. That's absolutely it. It's kind of like not quite right what you know, because that would imply that you're the serial killer, but right what you're passionate about. I, should, I think that's what it is, the more of it. And exactly. if what you're passionate about just happens to be also ranking, why not? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, perfect storm. Wait, 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 wait. Stop the music. Stop the music. That's right. We're Haunted MTL, and that means we get exclusives. And one of the cool exclusives we're bringing to you is she's going to read from her book. That's right. We've got Rihanna doing a book read right now. Hit it. Boy Underwater, Dennis Nielsen, The Story of a Serial Killer by Rihanna DeVerg. Chapter 2. The crippling loneliness gets darker and darker as the year goes on. Worst of all is Christmas time. Des sits with Bleep and Dee Dee and tries to imagine a life where this wasn't how it always had to be. A life where he could actually have settled down with someone and found some semblance of domestic bliss. He isn't stupid. He knows that Twinkle was only with him for the security of it all. There wasn't any romance between them, certainly not a good fuck. When they talked, it was Des yelling and Twinkle cowering or taking it on the chin placidly. There had never been any reason for him to stay for long. There have been a few others since Twinkle left, but they all left, one way or another. It seems as though no one can stand to be around him for long. Now, Des is about to ring in 1979 alone. He hates it. He can't stand it. The loneliness is like an oppressive force now, crushing him with a long and unbearable pain. He is even starting to feel a little detached, going through life as if it is a series of motions only. No one is even paying attention to him anymore. Bleep is good company, but not enough for the only company. It's New Year's Eve, for Christ's sake. Time to get out of here and find some fun. He heads out, but everywhere is quiet. 
people are finding fun in their own homes, gathering together with family and friends. He's had enough of this. Then at last it looks like the Cricklewood Arms is livelier than all of the rest. Not his usual kind of haunt, full of Irish Republicans for the most part. But it'll do. Any port in a storm. Des settles in at the bar. He tries not to think about getting passed over for a promotion yet again, or how his union activity doesn't seem to be making any difference. He tries not to think about the cold, empty flat. He tries not to think about the puppies buried in the garden, or the family back home in Scotland who he hasn't spoken to in years. He tries not to think about anything, and looks at the boy leaning up against the bar a short distance away. Pint of Guinness in hand, Des walks over to the smaller boy, casting a gaze over his curly brown hair, his young features, the gentle innocence of him. Des, he says, by way of introduction, holding out a hand. The boy goes to shake it instinctively. He has rough hands, despite his age. Des pegs him as a teen, though he's in here drinking sure enough. Must be at least eighteen, then. Stephen, the boy says, and now the two of them have a reason to go on talking. It turns out the boy is Southern Irish, down in the city for some exploration, talking about things like he's a man, when he clearly isn't. Des likes that about him. The cocksureness of it, combined with a shyness hidden behind the exterior. A shyness that he might be caught out. They knock back drink after drink at the bar together, until it finally comes closing time. Closing time on New Year's. Not worth thinking about, going home alone. If he drank himself to death alone tonight... Des knows with a certainty. If he drank himself to death alone tonight, Des knows with a certainty no one would find his body until he was stinking and rotten and attracting flies. Probably only then because people in the other flats would complain of the smell. So he invites young Steve back with him and they go for another drink in the flat. Some rum, some vodka, some more beer. What do they talk about? Des barely knows the answer himself once they leave the pub. But all of it is revolutionary. All of it would set the world on fire if someone else heard it. They talk about the working class and the government and the trade unions and the workforce. The boy nods his head a lot more the drunker he gets. Eventually, they're both so drunk they can't even do that. Des suggests they go to sleep and the boy nods again. They both undress, fumbling with drunk, awkward hands, the boy not even sober enough to feel bashful as he kicks his trousers over into the corner of the room. Des thinks, looking at him, that maybe the boy isn't quite 18 after all. They get under the covers, shivering a little when cold skin touches by accident, settling their spinning heads against pillows that will be spinning a lot more in the morning. When Stephen is asleep, Des wakes up and looks at him, and that feeling of loneliness descends again. It is a crushing despair. He is all alone, and in the morning, what then? This boy will leave, probably at the first chance he gets. He'll just be another ship passing in the night, another male floating away from him, no desire to stay. Suddenly, Des is desperate for him to stay. He is driven almost to tears by it. He wants it more than anything he can think of right then. He can't spend another night alone, not like this, not at New Year's. This is a time for fresh starts, not for sinking back into that same old black pit alone again. If only there was a way to make him stay. He pulls the blanket down over both of them, around halfway, so he can admire Stephen's body and his own. The fire has been on all night, so the small flat is warm enough. Idly, he sits and traces shapes and lines over the skin of Stephen's back, admiring how smooth and unmarked it is. He stays that way for hours basking in it, enjoying every part of Stephen that he can see. Then it is the morning. Stephen will be going soon. Des feels his heart pounding suddenly and arousal stirring. It brings a quick heat that makes him sweat, staring at this unconscious young body, feeling his own body respond. They didn't do anything last night. This body, though, it calls to him. He glances over at the floor and sees his tie lying there, pooled on top of his other clothes. He stares at it for a little while, sweating, nervous, feeling an excited energy which has never been so strong before. He reaches out and pulls the tie over. 
Stephen has to stay for the new year. He has to, whether he wants to or not. Des won't be alone again. He slips the tie over Stephen's neck, straddles him and pulls it hard. Stephen wakes up almost immediately, confused, still half drunk and half asleep. What the... He gets out, but Des pulls tighter and cuts him off. Stephen struggles and they roll together, off the bed and onto the floor, but Des has the upper hand. Stephen uses his feet desperately to push, trying to move his body further away, but Des is like a dog with a rat now. He knows he only has to hang on the longest, nothing more. The coffee table goes over, the glasses from last night, the ashtray goes, an almighty mess and clatter and Stephen's head is up against the wall and he has nowhere left to go. He struggles and struggles for a half minute more, getting weaker all the time. Finally, he goes limp and Des figures it is done. He stands up and lets go of the tie. He can feel himself trembling, the exertion and the tension taking away his core. It's all he can do to get his breathing under control. But then he hears a noise and realises that Stephen is breathing again too. Raspy, short, hard breaths. The breaths of someone trying to fight back to life. Well, that won't do at all. But what next? The tie didn't work. Des thinks for a moment and goes to the kitchen, then pulls out a bucket Des thinks for a moment and goes to the kitchen, then pulls out a bucket and fills it with water. That ought to do the job. Returning to Stephen, Des picks him up and drapes his limp body over a dining chair, the bucket of water close by. Now it's just an easy bit of work to move his head into the bucket and hold it there, under the water. Water splashes up and over the carpet there isn't a... Water splashes up and over the carpet, but there is no more struggle, no more movement. Just a few bubbles and it is done. It is done. Des looks at him for a moment, his still form, his head still under the water. This body is his now. This body has to stay. He lifts the body up and sets it comfortably in the chair, the head lolling back. Water drips from the curls of hair down onto the carpet. Des stares for a while, trying to get his thoughts in order. He wants to think clearly about what he has done, but it is hard to get a grasp on things. I strangled him nearly to death. I put his head in water deliberately. I drowned him. I killed him. He is dead, he thinks. He is still shaking, even harder now. He has killed someone. He has taken this boy's life and turned him into a body only. He thinks about Stephen's family, his mother and father, his siblings, perhaps, his friends. He thinks about the police. He thinks about prison and how many years you get for murder. He thinks about what you do with dead bodies and how to get rid of evidence. He thinks about the deaths he saw while he was in the army and how nobody cared at all if you killed someone there. He thinks about the death in his family, his dead grandfather. He thinks about masturbating in front of the mirror and pretending to be dead himself. He thinks about the old man and the powerless youth. He thinks about going to prison for a very long time. He thinks about the mess they have made in the room. He thinks about the coffee table and the glasses and the bucket of water and the water on the carpet. He thinks about the noise. He thinks about the sun rising soon. He thinks about being carted out in handcuffs. He thinks about going to work. He thinks about Stephen's family. He thinks about the body. Finally, he gets up and does something. He makes a cup of coffee and drinks it, smokes a cigarette, then another. He decides that he will continue to smoke until the shaking stops. He clears up the mess, the glasses and the coffee table, working around the body of the dead youth. Bleep wanders in from the garden and starts to sniff around. He can't have that. Fuck off, Bleep, he says grabbing her by the scruff of the neck and pushing her away from the body. She complies, head down, aware that she has displeased her master. Des takes the tie from the youth's neck and then sits down and looks at him. For a long time, he does not move again. Even if someone had come in, he would not have flinched for a single moment. He is contemplating this body, staring at it, until he knows what to do. Something comes to him, and he goes to run a bath. With it nearly full, he stops the water and grabs a towel. 
The towel is for covering the window, which does not have curtains. He doesn't want anyone to be able to see. He kneels down in front of the body and gently pulls it forward, over his right shoulder until he is able to lift it. He grasps the thighs of the body to hold it in place and carries it into the bathroom. He slides it carefully into the water and washes it all over, with washing up liquid, as if completing a secret ritual. The body is limp and floppy and moves strangely, making it hard to keep it steady. When it is clean, he picks up the slippery body again, pulling him by the wrists after other techniques fail. He sits it on the seat of the lavatory and wipes it dry with a towel. Now it is perfect. Des carries the body over his shoulder, back into the main room, and lays it on the bed. Des carries the body over his shoulder, back into the main room, and lays it on the bed. He tidies himself up, smoothing away the evidence of their struggle and of the messy bath, and then takes a closer look. The body has a slightly pinkish tinge to the face, the features are a little puffed up, and the lips are blue. The eyes and mouth are both partly open. Running his fingers over it, Des discovers that the body is still warm to the touch, as if alive. There is a wet mark on the pillow from the water left in the hair. Des pulls the covers up to his chin as if to tuck him in for the night, and sits down to stare at him again. He is waiting for the knock on the door, for the police to come. He sits and stares at the body, so that at least he will have a lasting memory to hold on to, when they come and take him to prison. <laughs>